Cryptids are animals that are popularly believed to exist, but science has never found any proof of them. They can also be thought of as urban legends or modern mythical creatures. They range from the very well-known ones, like Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster, all the way to what we're talking about today. First up, we're talking about an underwater cryptid. Usually I give stories about underwater monsters a bit more credibility because there's so many strange underwater creatures out there. For instance, the giant squid was thought of as a cryptid for a long time, but it turns out they're perfectly real, and we have video of them. I do not, however, lend a lot of credibility to the Oklahoma octopus. That's right, there's a contingent of people that think there are octopuses living in man-made lakes in Oklahoma. It's described as being kind of a reddish brown and about the size of a horse, which is very large for cephalopod. This would also be unusual because there are no known freshwater octopuses. Part of the reasoning of this creature existing is that a lot of people drown in Oklahoma's man-made lakes, but the much more likely explanation than a giant octopus is that Sooners like to drink. I also feel like due to the popularity of catfish noodling in Oklahoma, if these things existed, we would have evidence of it by now. Obviously, I don't find this creature very likely. I think the strongest suckers in Oklahoma are the lot lizards down at the Flying J. Our next cryptic contender may have one of the coolest names I've ever heard, but it's kind of lame. It's the Mongolian Death Worm. In Mongolian, it's also known as the Olgoi Korokoi, which means the large intestine worm. You may be thinking I'm being kind of harsh on the Mongolian death worm, but it's a lot less exciting once you learn what it's actually supposed to be. Let me paint a picture for you. Imagine the giant sand worms from Dune, except it's two feet long and red. The dang thing looks like you could buy it at a Phillies game. In the folklore, supposedly if you touch it, you will die, but I don't know why you would. Supposedly it can also shoot poison and or electricity. Believers seem split on this. In the 1980s, some scientists caught an animal and they brought it to some locals who said they'd seen the death worm before and they confirmed it was the same animal. The thing is that the animal they brought before them was the tartar sand boa. These snakes are fat little guys that only grow up to be about four foot long. They're not poisonous. Although they do look like the most shady snake I've ever seen. They kind of look like they're gonna sell me crypto. There are also legless lizards in the area that might have served as inspiration for this story. Also, in case you're wondering, Frank Herbert says he didn't know about these things when he wrote Dune. He was kind of basing it off the sandworms that live in the Pacific Northwest where he's from. In the end, after looking into this legend, I do not think the Mongolian death worm is the most worrisome worm I've heard about. I still think it's Dennis Rodman. Next up, we have a cryptid that's a bit more modern and urban. It is the world's stinky lake champion. It is the Fresno Nightcrawler. What the fuck is going on in here on this day? The Fresno Nightcrawler is a creature that's about seven feet tall, it's gray, and it kind of looks like one of those leaf bags that looks like a ghost got up and walked away. These big old funky dudes started showing up around 2010 around Fresno and Yosemite National Park. There have also been claimed sightings of these things in Billings, Montana, Ohio, and for some reason Poland. Early on, these things were claimed to be part of Native American folklore in the area, but the actual Native Americans in the area have shot this down. None of the stories of these things make it seem like they're a threat or anything, they just kind of walk around. And my theory for what they are is that John Cleese just likes to travel. While I'm 100% sure that all of the sightings of this thing are a hoax, I do think it's really fun. I like watching it walk around and it's really silly and I wish it was real. Mr. Nightcrawler, if you are watching this, I hope you walk your way over to Balenciaga because they will definitely hire you. Our next creature sounds like you catch it hanging out at the Abbey in LA, but it's actually from Ireland. It's the King Otter, also known as Dovarku. Dovarku. It's basically a large 15 foot long otter dog hybrid. They're mostly associated with living in County Leitrim in Ireland. In fact, in Conwall Cemetery in County Leitrim, there is a headstone of a woman who died in the 18th century that depicts the Dovarku. The local legend being that she was killed by it. The legend is that in the 1700s, a lady went down to the Glendale Lock to wash some clothes. And when her husband went to check on her, she had done got eight. Apparently the monster was still there sleeping on top of her corpse. Her husband ran home, grabbed a knife, came back and killed the Dovarku. And its death cries brought forth its mate out of the water as the second phase of the boss battle. Soon other locals hearing the cries came forth to help the man fend off this foul beast. And they managed to put down Dovarku to Electric Boogaloo. I don't think this one's very likely either, largely because Ireland's a fairly populated place and something that big would be seen. I also don't know what it'd eat. There's not a lot of large animals left in Ireland since the death of the Irish elk. I do think this would be a terrifying animal though. Otters are kind of scary anyways. If you've ever seen the Amazon River otters, they're like little water wolves. And you otter not mess with them. And now we're gonna talk about the Frank Reynolds of snakes, the Suchinoko. 
The Tsuchinoko is a magical snake that comes to us from Japan. They're supposed to be like 12 to 31 inches long, and they're unique because their body is fatter than their head and their tail. In other words, they kind of look like a Tootsie Roll. There are a few things that are interesting about these old chode snakes. First, they can talk, but they mostly lie and try to trick you. Two, they love alcohol. They will try to get it at any cost. A lot of you are probably thinking that this snake sounds like your ex. And lastly, these little guys like to get around by taking their tail, putting it in their mouth, and rolling like a wheel. They can also apparently jump up to a meter into the air. On top of this, they can also double jump, apparently. Every year on May 3rd in the Gifu Prefecture, they actually have the Suchinoko Festival, which is where everyone gets together and they go and try and find one. If you get one, you get 1.28 million yen. Another interesting thing about these guys is they apparently have a different name in just about every prefecture in Japan. Also, apparently the Pokemon Dunsparce is loosely based on these little critters. Sightings of these little guys has apparently gone up drastically in the last few decades because a lot of books and media have been using them in Japan, and it's just kind of caught on like wildfire. I think it's safe to say that these guys are not real because otherwise they would be world leaders by now. The last thing we'll be covering today is a bit more of a broad subject. We're going to be talking about Cyanocephali. <laughs> Cyanocephali simply means doghead. It's kind of used as a catch-all term for the fact that in ancient history, all over the world, there's a lot of accounts of people that just have dog heads. Obviously, the best known of these is Anubis, but there's a lot more out there. For instance, in the Coptic Church, there's the tale of St. Arrakis and St. Algani, who are both depicted as having dog heads. Also, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, many of the depictions of St. Christopher show him as having a dog head. There's a few versions of his story that have him with a dog head, but it's usually along the lines of he's a mercenary, he fights for the Romans and other people, and eventually he meets Jesus and he gets baptized and he loses his dog head. There's more stories of these dog-headed people ranging from ancient Egypt to Rome to Greece to Russia to China to India. They're really all over the place. Also an important distinction is a lot of these stories do talk about like actually talking to these people that have the dog heads and like doing business with them and everything. They're not just some weird beast out in the woods like Sasquatch. We have Cyanocephali accounts coming to us from everyone from Herodotus to Marco Polo to Christopher Columbus. Although those three aren't really trustworthy, it is interesting that it spanned that long a time. Apparently Cortez even got instructions to look for them while he was conquering the Aztecs. Now a lot of these could just be completely made up stories, or they could be some sort of like joke we don't get, kind of like the snails that get written in medieval texts. But I think there's a possibility that these and some other mythical creatures have a grain of truth to them. And I have a theory I want to share with you. I want you to think of it this way. If your grandmother came to you and said, there's a dog-headed man in the grocery store, would you think there's a supernatural creature? Or would you think there's something like this? I think that a lot of mythical creatures, such as the Cyanocephali, werewolves, skinwalkers, wendigos, anything else you can think of that's like an animal human thing, it could just be a furry. And before you come at me with like, furries are a modern thing, I want you to think about this. There's berserkers and many other warriors from back then that they would wear animal skins because they said it made them feel more like the animal. If a dude came up to you at the YMCA wearing an animal skin because it made him feel like a bear, you'd call him a furry. Something to keep in mind when you're looking at historical accounts is that we haven't really changed as a species since the rise of civilization. Cultural norms have changed and we've gained knowledge, but generally we have the same physiology and psychology that we've always had. And think about some of the other ones like skinwalkers and werewolves. Imagine someone's out in the woods furrying it up, they're in their animal skin, and then someone sees them and they stand up and look at them and either they run at them because they don't want them to tell their secret or they run away. Either way, that person is scared shitless and tells them they saw a wolfman. So think about it with the Cyanus Folly. These people are just wearing dog heads because they like it, and they're good at their jobs. Like, St. Christopher was apparently a great warrior. Imagine you had the best warrior in the world, but he wore his dog head all the time. You're like, okay, well, whatever, I guess. We'll deal with it. It's kind of like how Atari had to deal with Steve Jobs' awful farts when he worked there because he kept doing weird, like, fruit and veggie diets. I call this a unified furry theory, and I think that a large portion of animal-human hybrid kind of things that you see in history were just people seeing furries. So in summation, I think it is possible that St. Christopher was the sonic fox of early Christianity.